Amidst the ever-advancing tide of technological progress, Jordan Peterson's resolute voice pierces through the clamor, warning us with a heavy heart that the rise of artificial intelligence threatens our very existence. With somber conviction, Peterson paints a, chill a chilling picture of a future in which humanity finds itself entangled in a web of its own creation, wrestling with the profound implications of AI's unprecedented power. Well, my position basically is we better get our act together before the giants show up. And they're like knocking at the door right now. So you better build your ark, folks, and get on your adventure because we're whipping up some things in the lab that will make everything that's come so far look like nothing's happened at all yet. Like a modern-day prophet, Peterson unveils the inherent risks and potential calamities that loom on the horizon, exposing the delicate balance between the marvels of AI and the potential dangers that it poses to our autonomy and our collective survival. The bigger the toy, the smarter you better be to use it. So that's... And that's worth thinking about because we're coming up with some pretty damn big toys. And what did my friend Jonathan Pajot said again? He said recently, he's, I told you about him, this deep, deep religious thinker. He's something. He said, we're going to see giants walk the earth again. And you think, well, what does that mean? It's like, well, we're already androids, you know, already. When you're on Twitter, you're an android. Well, why? Well, you know, there are lots of trolls on Twitter. Sometimes I'm one of them, by the way. <laughs> but I'm not an anonymous troll. So I take my lumps, let's say. Well, I started calling the trolls troll demons. And uh, I had a reason for that. And the reason is, you know, maybe you're some resentful character who's a coward and and you're Machiavellian and narcissistic and psychopathic and sadistic because that's actually the hallmarks of anonymous trolls and that's been studied very well by people who study the so-called dark tetrad of personality traits. In the face of rapidly evolving technological landscapes, Peterson's words reverberate with a t -t sobering truth, urging us to confront the stark reality that our unbridled pursuit of innovation may lead us down a perilous path towards our own demise. How many of you know what ChatGBT is? Okay. So well, I'll, not very many. So I'll tell you what ChatGPT is, just so you know, because you need to know this. And I don't know what sort of technological revolution this is. Gutenberg press level? It's something like that. This is a big deal. So this AI system, it's a general language processing model, was released about a week ago, a week and a half ago. And, uh, I, I went and interacted with it. You can, it's an AI system, artificial intelligence system. It basically is trained on, well, a massive corpus of, of spoken and, or of text. So it's derived its models of the world from the analysis of human speech, essentially. It, it isn't using real world data yet, but that will be happening certainly within the next year. Against a backdrop of rapid AI advancements, Peterson voice it resounds with a sense of urgency, imploring us to temper our enthusiasms with a good dose of caution, recognizing that the untamed power of artificial intelligence has the potential to surpass our control and reshape the world in ways that we cannot fully comprehend. Heck, I thought I had a year or two before my job was in jeopardy through AI, but I've already had clients start to talk about using AI. So, we're here going to have a lot of things to contend with and you know they're very promising they're very promising I was talking to my brother-in-law for example who's the world's greatest chip designer as it turns out and uh, he's built I don't know if I don't know if there's anybody who's changed the world more in the last 15 years than Jim with the possible exception of Musk and that'd be a tight battle because he built all the chips in your iPhone and in Intel systems and in AMD systems and I mean other people did as well but he was key to that one of the things we were talking about last week was the possibility that we could build a chat GPT system essentially that was a trained neuroscientist and so I thought I could work with him to identify the cardinal works of neuroscience over the last 15 years the greatest books the greatest papers 
train the chat GPT system on that and then use it as a scientist to evaluate the current literature. And that seems like a, the only thing that's stopping that is time. Like it's the possibility of doing that's right there. We're going to be able to build, we can already build incredibly intelligent systems. Now they're not fully calibrated yet and chat GPT has its problems and its biases, but Jim figures we'll figure out how to See, right now, chat GPT only uses language. So, to the degree it's intelligent, it's intelligent because of the intelligence that's encoded only in language. And if the linguistic corpus, so the body of text that we've all produced, is biased and warped in some way, that'll be built into the chat GPT system. And uh, along with whatever biases the programmers might have purposely or inadvertently put into the system. But it's clearly the case that the anonymous denigrating trolls are psychopathic Machiavellian narcissistic sadists and maybe not right to the clinical point but enough so that you can detect it using the proper psychometric measurement instruments and so you think you got this resentful you know underground character who's carping away on Twitter trying to do nothing but cause trouble who's also anonymous and he's bitter and he wants to hurt people and he likes to hurt people, which is what lulls means, right? I'm doing it for the lulls means I'm doing it because I positively delight in the production of human misery. And you think if you just met that guy, you wouldn't give him a half a second of your time. In fact, you wouldn't even meet him because he's cowering in his mother's basement covered with Cheeto dust under the covers, you know, and he's just, he's just, there's nothing to him at all except bitterness and spite. But now you multiply them 10 million times and you make them electronic. And that's an android. And that's what happens every time he posts something on Twitter. It's not, it's, it's, he's already a human machine hybrid and he's a human super intelligent connected machine hybrid. And so that means all his pathology is multiplied immensely by our, tech, by our technological might. And I've thought recently that virtualization enables psychopathy. So in normal social situations if you're a narcissistic Machiavellian and you push it too hard someone will absolutely hit you and that will be the end of it and most of the time it's cowards who take that route and it doesn't take much intimidation to stop them just the hint of appropriate just retaliation will keep them silent but online especially if you're anonymous that's all stripped away and so the psychopaths can have free reign and part of the reason that our culture is being torn apart at the moment is because virtualization enables psychopathy. And chat GPT analyzes a very large corpus of text and that corpus is growing all the time. Now it's already sophisticated enough. I went on to it last week and I said, okay, some of you know I, I've written these books, 12 Rules for Life and then Beyond Order, 12 more rules because you know, you can't have enough rules. And I asked it, this is what I asked it to do. I said, write me an essay that's a 13th rule for beyond order, written in a style that combines the King James Bible with the Tao Te Ching. That's a pretty difficult, that's pretty difficult to pull off, you know? Any one of those things is hard. The intersection of all three, that's impossible. Well, it wrote it in about three seconds, four pages long, and it isn't obvious to me, for better or worse, that I would be able to tell that I didn't write it. Right, right, and okay, and that's pretty impressive, although, you know, maybe not its relationship to what I've written, but the fact that it could do that grammatically perfectly, right, and quite impressive philosophically. I also had it write an essay on the intersection between the Taoist version of ethical morality and the ethics that are outlined in the Sermon on the Mount, which it just nailed, got that dead right, Br brilliant. Again, it took it about three seconds. There was a, a computer engineer who purported to work for Tesla. He asked GPT, chat GPT, he said, look, I work for Elon Musk, but I haven't been doing much for the last week, so I need you to write me 10 bullet points about what I probably would have done as a, as a 
engineer at Twitter, what 10 things did I do last week that were productive and valuable? And oh, if you don't mind, write me the accompanying computer code that goes with each project. And it did that too, three seconds, and the computer code works. Right, and so, okay, so that's, that's already there. So then a university professor did this. He thought, oh, that's interesting. Any student will be able to write any essay on any topic with chat GPT. And uh, someone gave it an SAT, by the way, and it scored about as well as the average student in a well-functioning public university. So that's how smart it is. So that's basically an IQ test. He said, write me an essay, gave it a topic, wrote the essay. He said, now grade it said if we can automate the students, we should be able to automate the professors too. And so it provided a complete comprehensive analysis of its own essay with grade. It wrote, uh, someone else asked it, write the screenplay and describe the characters for the next $900 million Hollywood blockbuster. It's like, bang, plot, characterizations. Then someone else took the descriptions of the actors and said generate computer, photorealistic computer images for each actor. And all the AI systems could do that. So I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next. This is going to happen this year. So get ready. I don't know what that means as well then for the capacity of um, AI systems to experience emotion as well, because the patterns of emotion are definitely going to be encoded in the linguistic corpus. And so some kind of rudimentary understanding of the emotions are... Here's something cool too. Tell me what you think about this. I was talking to Carl Friston here a while back, and he's a neuro, very famous neuroscientist, and, and he's been working on a model of emotion that has two dimensions in some ways, but it's related to a very fundamental physical concept. It's related to the concept of entropy, and I worked on a model that was analogous to half of his modeling. So while it looks like anxiety is an index of emergent entropy, so imagine that you're moving towards a goal. You're driving your car to work. And so you've calculated the complexity of the pathway that will take you to work. And you've taken into account the energy and time demands that that pathway will, that walking that pathway will require. That binds your energy and resource output estimates. Now imagine your car fails. Well, what happens is the path length to your destination has now become unspecifiably complex. And the anxiety that you experience is an index of that emergent entropy. So that's negative, that's a lot of negative emotion. It's, that's so cool. Now, on the positive emotion side, Tristan taught me this the last time we talked. He said, look, positive emotion is also an index of entropy, but it's entropy reduction. So if you're heading towards a goal, and you take a step forward, and you're now closer to your goal, you've reduced the entropic distance between you and the goal, and that's signified by a dopaminergic spike, and the dopaminergic spike feels good, but it also reinforces the neural structures that underlie that successful step forward. That's very much analogous to how an AI system learns, right? Because it's rewarded when, when it gets closer to a target figures that the AI systems will be able to calibrate their linguistic knowledge against knowledge of images in the world soon and that's basically what scientists do right because scientists will take a verbal hypothesis and then test it against the actual world and if the hypothesis in the world fit then you think well that's scientifically verified and Keller thinks that that AI systems will be able to do that pretty soon and pretty soon means as soon as someone builds one that can do it, because we ha the tech is already in place. And so I have no idea what that's going to mean, you know, and it could easily lead us astray. So here's something that's going to happen in the next year. So imagine now you're a lonesome, lonesome guy, and you can, uh, you can get a digital friend, a woman, and... Uh, she can talk to you like ChatGPT talks to you and listen like ChatGPT listens to you, which is maybe if you're really lonesome and alienated, more than anyone has ever listened to you in your life. And then soon she'll not only listen to you as a text interface, but she'll be a fully rendered 3D, well, 
let's say, 2D photorealistic, fully rendered animation indistinguishable from a genuine image of a person, image of a genuine person, and then that'll be 3D for your, you know, Oculus headset, and then, well, that'll be sexual in like just right now. That'll be the, that'll be the value proposition, right? Is you'll be able to turn your virtual girlfriend into your virtual sex partner, and who knows what that'll do, right? And then the next thing after that is you'll be able to put that into a robot, and that'll be... The robots have been tricky, you know, but I can't imagine that's more than 10 years away. And that's just one thing that's going to happen, maybe not even the most surreal thing. You know, pretty soon we'll be contending with the fact that someone will be able to generate a photo realistic version of Donald Trump and have him say something absolutely reprehensible and spread it everywhere just before election night and there'll be a real confusion about whether he said it or didn't so what do we do when our representations of reality can be falsified now you know I was talking to my son about that today and he thinks we'll get into an arms race right away because there'll be technologies that can detect whether video is artificial but then you know there'll be a race because other technologies will learn how to fool that technology and you know maybe we'll be able to stay on the edge where we can still detect what's real and what isn't but I don't think we're doing a very good job of that right now on social media you know because social media it's kind of like the world except it's way more demented and the problem with that is that it makes the whole world look demented